Welcome to Renegade Inc. Most of us are trapped in the cult of busy. Packed schedules, immediate gratification, wall-to-wall -wall Zoom calls, and the incessant ding of your so-called smart device. It's not making us happy, and all the associated consumption is trashing the planet for those who aren't here yet. So how do we free ourselves from this tyranny and become a time rebel? Roman, welcome. Uh, Renegade Inc. here at Coconomics, our partners. Earlier this year, you, uh, we met and you'd written The Good Ancestor. Um, and during the programme, which caused a bit of consternation, I'm not going to lie, uh, you said that the Norwegians, the good people of Norway, are international drug dealers. Uh, and we got emails for this. <laughs> How dare you talk about our country in that way? Uh, qualify it. Why are the Norwegians, in your view, international drug dealers? I did say that, and I still believe it. No, that's so more emails. why email. are the Norwegians well, That's more emails, by the way. <laughs> Sorry about that. But, well, it's clear that the Norwegians are international drug dealers. The drug, of course, are fossil fuels. Right. Okay, so we all know Norway is the eighth biggest fossil fuel producer, exporter in the world. It's the third biggest exporter of natural gas. And... In my book, The Good Ancestor, I've got this index called the Intergenerational Solidarity Index, which rates countries on their long-term public policy performance. And the Norwegians are nowhere near the top of the list because that measure penalizes countries for fossil fuel production because that is all about dumping ecological damage on future generations. Right. Right? For me, this is all about intergenerational solidarity and long-term thinking. And the phrase I like to use is the idea of being a time rebel being someone who is committed to thinking not about the here and now, not addicted to seconds, minutes and hours, not constantly clicking the buy now button and checking your latest message, but about having a long-term vision, about thinking and planning in your own life, but also in public life or the business you work in or the college that you're at, thinking decades, centuries, even millennia into the future. Now that sounds crazy, but if you think back to Jonas Salk, he was the guy who discovered the polio vaccine back in 1955. He said, the great challenge of our century is to be a good ancestor. Right. Okay. And that's about thinking about, well, how are we going to be judged by all those generations to come? You know, if you think about it, okay, there are 7.7 .7 billion people alive today. And over the last 50,000 years, an estimated 100 billion people have been born and died. But they are far outweighed by the nearly 7 trillion people who will be born over the next 50,000 years, assuming current birth rates you know, stabilize this century. And you know, even in the next couple of centuries, tens of billions of people will be born. You know, amongst them, all your grandchildren and their grandchildren and all the friends and communities on whom they'll depend. So there's a real question. You know, those future generations are looking at us and asking us, well, what did you do? You know, how did you respond to what you knew? about the ecological crisis, about technological risks being thrust on future generations, like the threats from you know, bioweapons or um, artificial intelligence powered lethal autonomous weapons, all sorts of things like that. And so this is really about, you know, when you're thinking to yourself, right, how can I be a good ancestor? How can I pivot away from the addiction to fossil fuels we've inherited from the 19th century, really? Well, it begins by wanting to describe yourself as a good ancestor or really as a time rebel, someone committed to something longer. See, that's really interesting, the time rebel bit, because when people um, think, well, I can't change the fossil fuel industry uh, and they feel helpless, what you're actually doing is returning power to the individual. So you can actually change something. You can rebel against the tyranny of time because we live in an era which is the, I'd call the cult of busy. Whenever you ask anyone, even during a pandemic, how are you, busy? How are you, what are you doing? That? I'm doing that. And if you're not busy, it looks as though you're not trying hard enough or you're not you good enough in your life. What you're getting at here is if you become a time rebel, you get away from that tyrannous relationship with your watch. Exactly. That we need to pivot away exactly from the short termism, which we are structured into by technologies, which keeping us clicking and, and swiping. And of course, by our public institutions, which are forcing us into the here and now, you know, everyone's focused on the next election, the next headline, the next tweet, and so on. We've got to think bigger. Now, who are we? What arrogance is it to think that, you know, we can break the chain of life without ecological degradation and technological risk? And I think that kind of realization, it kind of, at least for me and for my kids, it 
opens you to this idea, okay, let's try and think a little bit longer. When I'm going shopping and picking up some green beans which are flown from Kenya into my supermarket in England or in, in Norway or wherever you happen to live, you know, you can ask yourself, well, am I being a good ancestor when I buy this stuff? You know? And you know, of course, Norway has this huge kind of contradiction going on. On the one hand, it is incredibly long-termist on some fundamental level in terms of the investment for future generation that goes on within Norway's borders. Investment in health, investment in education. Norway's sovereign wealth fund is what finances that amazing amount of renewables in the economy, people driving Teslas and so on. Yet the dark side flipped that coin around. Well, where has a lot of that wealth come from? Well, that sovereign wealth fund, of course, has come from the, the, fi the, the financial returns of the fossil fuel industry, mm. right? Over a trillion dollars, nearly $200,000 for every single Norwegian. And if that sovereign wealth fund is really about caring about future generations, well, it's only really caring about Norway's future generations. Well, what about those outside the borders? And even Norway's own future citizens are going to have to deal with the problems created by that fossil fuel industry. In other words, you know, cl the climate change effects, biodiversity loss, air pollution, all sorts of things. So there's a real tension at the heart of it all. We can't think that whether the, the great politician taking the long view is going to do it for us. We can't think Greta Thunberg's going to do it for right. us. You know, we can't think, I can't think, well, it's all my kid's problem and they're going to have to deal with it and, and go on the streets. No, I think we all need to be playing a role uh, in, in all of this. What um, do uh, the countries, Portugal, uh, Wales and Sweden have in common? Right, let's start with Wales. Well, what they've all got in common is that in all three countries, there are moves to become time rebels in the political realm. There are new institutions and laws emerging to extend time horizons in political thinking and economic thinking. So Wales has a future generations commissioner. It's a public position. And the commissioner's job is to look at the impact of legislation in healthcare, environment, transport, education, its impact going at least up to 30 years in the future. How is it going to affect the well-being of the next generation? Now, as the, the future generations commissioner's name is Sophie Howe, she will admit herself she doesn't have enough power and she'd like more. But there are now movements around the world trying to copy the Welsh example. I mean, in the UK, for example, um, there, uh, there is a bill in Parliament now for the whole UK to have a future generations commissioner. They're talking about this in the Netherlands as well. So that's Wales. Sweden's really interesting because a few years ago they appointed what became known as a minister of the future to really embed foresight and long-term thinking into public policy. It was only a temporary position, but again, other countries have been picking up on this. In the UAE, there is a ministry of the future and cabinet affairs. In Japan, there are moves to have set up a ministry of the future. In Singapore, in fact, they've got very highly developed uh, foresight capabilities built into decision making right at the heart of government. And then Portugal. Right. So Portugal is really inter interesting because about half a dozen young people have been uh, filed a case with the European Court of Human Rights claiming rights for future generations to a clean and healthy atmosphere. This is a revolution in the legal sphere. And it builds on the work of organizations, for example, in the US called Our Children's Trust, which is a amazing public interest law firm, which has filed a landmark case with the US government um, on behalf of 21 young people arguing for the legal right to a safe climate and healthy atmosphere for both current and future generations. Now, these are David versus Goliath struggles, but they are going on in Portugal now, in the US. There's a successful case recently in the Netherlands, in Colombia, a successful case in Uganda. This is probably the biggest change in human rights since the French Revolution. The idea of giving rights to people who aren't even alive now. Now that is a serious time rebellion happening. I'm not saying it's going to be quick, but every country could be supporting this, whether it's in Scandinavia or in other parts of Europe or you know, in, in Latin America and Asia. One uh, of the interesting things around the Welsh model um, is one of the uh, aims is to um, challenge public sector culture. Because I'd argue inertia is one of the most powerful uh, forces on earth, not gravity. <laughs> and um, basically, to try and change cultures, as you know, it's almost impossible because you have to think root and branch. But what they've called for is, uh, it's a call for bravery, 
broad thinking and collaboration. And for people who've bumped into public sector know that they're not famed for bravery, broad thinking and collaboration. Is that the gauntlet laid down for other people thinking like this, that actually we have to stand up now within those organisations? Well, it's, there's a funny kind of tension or contradiction here, because in some level, public bodies are more likely to take the long view than your elected politicians, whether they are civil servants or in the judicial sphere and so on, on some level. But at the same time, as you say, there is this incredible inertia. I'm a believer in cultural change. I founded a museum called the Empathy Museum because I thought it wasn't enough to try and lobby governments about how do we empathize with people living on the social margins today and empathize with future generations. We need to change the cultural conversation. And I think around uh, public bodies, there is this kind of um, stasis and unwillingness to shift. For example, you know, one of the great shifts that we need now is to shift from the addiction to GDP growth, which has dominated politics since the end of the Second World War, whether it's governments which are neoliberal or Keynesian or Marxist, whatever, they've all wanted the same thing, endless growth, right? And we need to shift now to more regenerative economies, to circular economies, to getting rid of waste by you know, having B corporations, triple bottom line accounting, a whole load of different mechanisms. I mean, again, there in that sphere, the Norwegians you know, have got a lot of their own companies they can look towards, but they can also look towards Sweden. There's that famous company, Houdini, that makes um, ski wear and hiking gear, and their customers can eat their own clothes that they've bought. And what they do, they've got completely um, you know, organic wool materials for the, their hiking gear. And Houdini has set up a composting facility in Stockholm, I believe, where you can throw your old ski jacket, your old hiking jacket, it turns into soil, and they have served meals to their customers made out of their old clothes, right? That is the kind of economic kickstart that we need in our minds, really, and of course in practice too, to really have a long-term vision because ultimately, if we can't learn to live within the boundaries of this one and only planet we know that sustains life, then we ain't gonna go nowhere. Unless you're Elon Musk and think we can just run across to Mars and that'll solve all our problems. I'm not with him on that. Bizarre, and bizarre. Is it the case though, as a public philosopher, you talk about these concepts. The reason you founded the Empathy Museum is that actually you wanted to put something tangible in people's hands. The uh, Houdini example, they're actually putting a product in people's hands they can touch and feel, recycle or break down and then create something else out of. Is it the case that we human beings have to be able to touch it first because we're not very good theoretically? That's a really interesting question. I'm not quite sure I know the answer to that. I know the answer for myself. You know, I'm a writer mm. uh, and a philosopher, self-invented public philosopher. I invented that term myself. And I believe in the power of ideas. Uh, absolutely. That's why I write books about ideas. I believe ideas can change society. But you've been practical as well. Well, exactly. Over the years, I've learned... Huh, you can write the best book in the world that you, that you want, but that ain't going to change nothing necessarily. Maybe that works for some uh, politicians or people in the economic field or activists, but actually you've got to start putting these things into practice and get people to literally embody change. So when I wrote a book on empathy, I then founded this thing called the Empathy Museum, and one of our main exhibits is called A Mile in My Shoes. You walk inside, it's a gigantic shoebox, it looks like a shoebox, uh, you can go inside, it's the world, world's first empathy shoe shop, you're fitted with the shoes of a stranger, it could be someone who's been in prison for 14 years, or a Syrian refugee, or a bored investment banker, and you can literally walk a mile in their shoes while listening to an audio narrative of them talking about their own life in their own words. So you're literally embodying another person. It's amazing how this changes people. Even when people don't listen to, or they listen to a very extreme story of a refugee, but even just an everyday story of a florist, you start getting a little bit outside yourself. And I think if we're going to instigate any kind of change in economics, in politics, or other realms, we need to get outside the boundary of the ego. You know, this is the first thing we've got to go beyond. But you do it by experience, ultimately, not just reading books written by people like me. talk about ego a little bit um, because if you're going to be a time rebel how do you uh, marry that if you like um, with the uh, sense of yourself or who you think you are because ultimately what you're going to have to do is put down a lot of the things that you thought about yourself yeah I think we have to realize that who we are doesn't just end 
at the on the outside of my skin you know i'm much more than this describe that okay so for example well let's do a little imaginative thought experiment okay if you're willing to do this with yes. me okay just close your eyes for a moment and just imagine a young person in your life who you really care about it could be your own child or a nephew or a niece or, or some other young child so just picture them in your mind's eye now imagine them 30 years in the future still with your eyes shut it's like a little meditation here imagine 30 years in the future picture their face think about the struggles they're facing and the joys in their life just picture that for a moment and now send your mind forward to their 90th birthday party and they're surrounded by family and friends and, and old work colleagues and neighbors it's their birthday go and have a look outside the window what's going on in that world there and now imagine someone comes over to them and puts a tiny baby into their arms it's their first great-grandchild and they look down at that baby's eyes and think to themselves well what would this baby need to survive and thrive for the years and decades ahead now open your eyes again that was a little journey where to the 22nd century if you think about it that tiny baby could be alive well you know 200 years from now their future isn't science fiction it's an intimate family fact hmm. it's just a couple of steps away from your life or my life anybody's life doing that kind of little thought experiment so to answer the question about the ego if we really think about who we are and what we care about well we are beings that transcend just our own life or our own bodies we transcend the generations because most of us care we care about going back into the past parents grandparents we care about children grandchildren and if you think about that little baby living at the end of the 22nd century potentially they are not alone they are embedded in a web of relationships and community and the web of the living world the air that they breathe the water they drink the food they eat so if you care about that baby then you care about something much bigger. Interestingly, you go through the heart, not the head, because the head often will say, well, no, I've made these uh, assumptions about life and that's me and that's it. And, uh, but actually, when you start to open the heart artistically, then you start to uh, get traction. It's really interesting because I said to, we have um, two little ones, and I said to my wife about three months ago, I, imagine we're not going to be around when um, our youngest or either of them, our grandmother, or it's unlikely that we're going to be around when they're still here. And she said, please don't say that because it, and she really wells well, up. Well, it can be a little bit too much, but that's of course, what, but you can see the effect right. of it. Well, and what we know, of course, from, the last 15 years of climate change campaigning is you can feed people with all the facts in the world doesn't work. and it doesn't do anything. In fact, it probably further entrenches their position. Absolutely. It They'll can buy two it. Range Rovers and leave one running, right? Right, exactly. And so that's why whether I am talking to top politicians or investors or radical activists on the ground, I tend to start talking about the heart, about legacy, about our connection across the generations, about the idea of being a good ancestor, the idea of being a time rebel because you know human beings are social creatures aristotle told us that two and a half thousand years ago you know and in the end you can have as many gourmet meals by yourself as you like but in the end you want somebody sitting with you and let's also have someone from a future generation sitting with us in fact i'd love company board meetings to leave a chair for the child or or, or the stakeholders from the future think of them as future holders mm. if you become a time rebel is one of the um side effects of doing that uh, to begin to cure some of the loneliness that's around at the moment. You know, a funny thing is I once listened to this talk by a New Zealand Maori activist, a children's rights activist. She was standing up talking. She said, I want to tell you something. Here in the room, I am here. But so are the dead and the unborn. I am part of a great chain of life. And I can see them all. And there's a Maori word for this. It's called whakapapa. It's the Maori idea of genealogy or lineage, the idea that we are all in a great chain that stretches far into the past and long into the future. Okay? And I think this is the kind of mentality that we need to embody and engender. And you, know, you can find this kind of mentality, for example, in Norse legends, the, uh, the idea of tracing back the generations, knowing all of your forefathers and foremothers, 
And you know, you can go to Japan where there's this kind of idea of ancestral worship and respect is very deep. We can build long-term vision on that to recognize that the here and the now is not the only now. We can have a longer sense of now that stretches far back and far forward. Uh, does that create a richer existence? Yeah, that's what existential sustenance is all about. <laughs> wow. Well, that's a big statement, but let me, let me say, tell you what I mean by that. Unpack that. I will unpack that slightly. Gosh. Okay, if I think about what is it that gives human beings meaning? I think there's three things, really. It's buying stuff, isn't it? Oh, buying stuff, yeah. Well, buying stuff you'll get, will get you only so far, but then you hit a plateau. And as you know, the more stuff you buy and, and uh, more material wealth that you have, well, then your happiness tends to, to level out. But what, one thing we need is human relationships, okay? Because we are relational creatures. We need relationships in today's world, but I think there is existential sustenance in connecting with past and future as well. That's why so many cultures still have deep intergenerational uh, connection written into them. In, there's the Native American idea of seventh generation decision making, for example, a kind of ecological stewardship, thinking about the impacts of your actions seven generations, 150, 200 years ahead. So that, these guys were time rebels? They were time rebels before I even thought of that term time rebel, um, long before. This kind of long-term thinking, being a time rebel, is good for our existential sustenance, but it also does something really important for human beings if you do it the right way, is that human beings are biophilic creatures. We are drawn to nature and the living world. This is a term biophilia from the uh, great um, biologist um, E.O. Wilson, who's still with us today. And you know, what he pointed out was that human beings are naturally, you know, a child will see a flower and want to sort of sniff it. They can't help but pat a dog, you know, and we find, sustenance in connecting with the living world. And ultimately, if you want to be a real time rebel, here's the trick. Don't just think about lengthening time, but think about regenerating place. This is the idea that if we are only going to survive as a species for the long term, if we learn to live within the boundaries of this one and only planet. So it's about falling in love with ice sheets and with savannas, with rivers and with mountains with reconnecting with the long cycles of nature. There's a beautiful Mohawk blessing spoken when a child is born that goes like this. Thank you, Earth. You know the way. Now that is all about caring about place as much as time. And I think, and there is a lot of psychology research around this, if we can make that connection with the living world, it adds something to who we are. Have we got it a bit wrong here insofar as we think in linear terms? So we're born at zero and then we die at 80. So, as opposed to thinking depth, have, have we sort of got the, the equation wrong? Because we've thought, well, we start here and end there, but actually there's a way we can go, which is uh, within, and that's far richer and far deeper. Well, it's interesting, actually. If you look back at the history of Christianity, one of the biggest problems of Christianity is that it, played havoc with our conception of time because it introduced the idea of linear time, that there was a beginning of the world, you know, and then there's sort of a midpoint and maybe there'll be an end of the world. It wasn't only Christianity that did that, but what we lost was the idea actually of not so much deep time, but the idea of cyclical time. Okay, and a lot of indigenous cultures have maintained that idea of staying in touch with the ecological choreography of the planet. Now we're worried about the fiscal year and not, you know, the, the lunar month. Um, you know, we've lost touch with the seasons. We are worried about the electoral cycles and so on. We've got all our cycles, but they are ones that we have invented, we have imposed. So I think we need to get away from that idea of linear time where there's a sort of, you know, past, present, and the arrow of time goes uh, into the future and do something slightly different. And in, in Bali, they have this idea of the Pokawan calendar, which is a calendar of circles and cycles. And basically, instead of people thinking, oh, I'm doing this next week or next month, time is lived more in pulses. There are days which they call full days and empty days. Full days are days where you have lots of rituals, you see your family. Empty days are days where you kind of sit around and don't do very much. I thought, well, that's not a bad way to live. And in a sense, that does give a kind of depth to time. Give us the first step to becoming a time rebel. The first step is literally a step. 
and then another step and go and visit an ancient tree. Find a tree that's over a thousand years old near where you live. There probably is one. Go there with your family. Have a picnic under it. Don't take a selfie. Go and follow the <laughs> advice of the great Vietnamese monk Thich Nhat Hanh who said, don't just sit there, do something. Sit under that tree, connect with its age, with the depths of time. Don't just sit there, do something. There's also an adage which is don't just do something, sit there. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> Thank you very much for pointing that out. Right. Don't just do something, sit there. That was Thich Nhat Hanh. Right. Um, because the other way around would be the management consultancy, right? Exactly. Finally, how do we get Norway into the top uh, uh, three? Top three of the Intergenerational Solidarity League table? Because I tell you, Iceland are up there, Sweden are up there, Denmark are up there. Oh. Yeah, but also there are some non-wealthy OECD countries there too, like Costa Rica Nepal. And, and Nepal, Uruguay. This index rates countries on... 10 different indicators, environmental, social, and economic, from investment in healthcare to um, renewable energy. But if Norway wants to jump up the table, the reason they're down at number 26, which is shocking, really, for such an advanced society that gets the top ratings, as you said, in indices of happiness and equality, uh, wealth equality, and so on. The problem with Norway is its fossil fuel production. Nah. That is what brings it down. Right. That's what brings Saudi Arabia down. That's what brings you know, Venezuela down. So. This is a country that needs to wean itself off its fossil fuel addiction. Roman Krasnowicz, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>